let go and let God, let God do his work. Let go and let God do his work. You know, it's a great message, folks. We, we try to do it ourselves. If we just let go and let God do it, he'll, he'll do it for us. We'll let him. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 4. If you want to find that, you can as Jimmy comes. And we'll take the offering up this morning. And if you have an offering to give the Lord today, why don't you give it? I'd like to say again, welcome to our visitors who came with us this morning. We appreciate y'all being here today. God bless y'all. Father, as we come to you today, we just thank you for the offering. We bless you, Father, and thank you for it. We bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, Truly righteous and holy. That's a New Living Translation. Now, as you look at that, I'm going to show you. Have anybody ever heard? I don't know if 
somebody, if, if Eric remembers this or not, I just happened to think about this just last night a little bit. When we had our uh, first concert out here, we had a saying uh, that we put up our, our uh, like every year, you know, we do like at our homecoming, we have like old fashioned day or, a or theme. 60s, a theme. Yeah, well, thank you, Mary. We had a theme. And the theme of it was let go and let God. You remember that saying? Get God. Get God, yeah. But let go and get God. That's what we used. This is basically the same thing. How many of you have ever heard of that? Let go and get God. Or let go and let God let go, let go, do your let job. Let Him do your work. This is what this, I, you know, I thought about that and, and, and I thought it was pretty close. But it was let go and get God is what it was. But we can use the same thing. Let go and get God. <laughs> let go and get God and let Him do the work for you. Let Him do the work in your life. Melissa inspired me with that this week. She showed me something in her book that she reads every day. And it says we need to allow God to do His work in our lives. That's what it says. We need to allow God to do His work in our lives. And in, in the, in the uh, Bible, it tells us in, in Ephesians chapter 4 that we need to put off the old man and put on a new man. Let go of our lives and let God take control of our lives. That's what he's telling us. And, and three things I want to show you this morning on this, on this uh, uh, scripture. Number one is I want to show you how to let go of your agenda. In order for God to use you, in order for God to have his way in your life, you need to let go of our agendas. The second thing I'm going to uh, try to get you to understand this morning, let you understand, is let go of our idols. We need to let go of our idols. Anything that's not of God is an idol. And the third thing we're going to do is let go of our old selves. Let go of us. These are the three things that I want to show you this morning in this scripture. <clears throat> Now, if we'll let, let God take control of our agendas, and we, how we're going to do it is by letting Him direct our paths. Let Him show us which way we need to go. Anytime that you need to go somewhere, regardless, you need to ask God, should I go in this direction? Or should I not? Whether it's intentional or not, folks, listen, we all have agendas to our lives. We all have them. Whether it's intentional or not. And we have it for our futures. We make up our stuff that we want to do for our future. Don't we not? We want to have stuff made up for our futures. Some are more immediate than others. Others are more sophisticated. Some are better. Some are not as good. Some are good. Some are bad. Some are planned out. Some are not. But they do exist, don't they? We all have our own agenda of our lives, of what, how we want our lives to go. And we make them up. Most of us are not simply just drifting through life. We have something that we want to do. We have something we want to, some place we want to go. There's something in our lives that each one of us have always wanted to do. Every one of us have that, right? We've got something that we all want to do. The priorities we set, the standard by which we make our goals, and the gauge of our success, the plans and the dreams by which we live our lives are all part of our personal agenda. It's all part of our personal agenda. No matter what it is, whether it's the plans we have, how we want our success to be, uh, our dreams, uh, whatever it may be, we all have it part of our personal agenda. Each one of us have a personal agenda that we want to do. These determine the consistent pattern of decisions and actions which illustrate the agenda by which we live. Each one of these. But God has a better design. No matter how much you plan it, no matter how much success you're looking for, God has a better design for you than what you could ever devise yourself. He has a better design for you. No matter what it is, He has a better one. God is our good shepherd. The shepherd leads the flock. God's our provider. He provides all we need. He's our guide. He guides us in the way that we need to go. He's our protector, right? He protects us from all evil harm. He's our host in this life. He's our host. He's our shepherd in this life. Listen to me. He's our shepherd in this life. He's our provider. He's our guide. He's our protector. And also the life to come. Amen? Amen. That's what he does. His agenda for his children is for a blessed life. 
that we can have the hope, the blessed hope, of knowing that it's going to take place, but it just hasn't taken place yet. That's what the blessed hope means, folks. We know it's coming. We know it's happening, but it isn't come yet. For some, it's already came. They've gone on to be with the Lord. Some, it's already happened. They've already went. So they've got that blessed hope. We're still looking for it. We're looking for a righteous life. We're looking for a life lived for a greater purpose than what we could ever establish ourselves. And the only way we're ever going to get it is that God take control of our agendas. Romans, this is what it says in Romans. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. We know that. The Word of God tells us that. We must be willing to let go of our own agendas in order to accept the agenda of God until we let go and allow God to do His job in our lives and do His work in our lives. We've got to be able to accept the agenda, to turn over the agenda to God that we have. No matter what it is. You know, on our 25th wedding anniversary, Melissa and I went on a cruise. I've never been on one. I've always thought it'd be nice to go on a cruise. They are nice. So my, one of my life, things in life was to go on a cruise. I went on one for seven days. I gained 15 pounds and I ain't never lost it since. <laughs> all I did was eat. That's all they do on them things. They eat, 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 eat. You eat, drink, or gamble is what you do. So we all have an agenda. I've always wanted to do it. But you know what? I have no desire to do that again. No desire at all. I did it once in a life. Every one of us has something that we want to do, right? Yeah. When we do that, then our agenda can be fulfilled only with God when we allow God to take control of our lives. We must be willing to let go of our own and accept the agenda of God. Accepting God's agenda requires that we accept God's truth. Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say that I am the way. He didn't say, I am the way, the truth. He didn't say that he may be the truth. He said, I am the truth. And I am the life, not a life. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. You can't make it there any other way. We must be willing to do that. It requires us to accept God's truth in order to let God have our agenda. If we accept God's agenda, we must choose what we will be the foundation of our lives. We must choose what's going to be the foundation of our lives. The social, the ethical, and the moral codes of God are not those of the world. This world is not our home, folks. If you're a child of God, this world is not your home. You're just passing through this world. What we believe to be true, this is this now. What we, what, we, what we believe to be true affects every aspect of our lives. Everything in our lives. What we, what we believe to be true. Whether we believe that Jesus is the truth or not, it still affects your life. No matter what it is. It affects who you are and what you are. You know, my mama used to tell us this. I used to tell my kids this. The best thing you can do is tell me the truth and let me beat your butt. <laughs> That's the best thing you can do. Because if you lie, you're going to tell another lie to try to cover up that lie. And the more lies you tell, the more you're going to get your butt beat. You know what I'm saying? So just tell me the truth and let me discipline you the way you need to be disciplined and just forget about it. You see, folks, what we believe to be true affects our lives of who we are and what we are and what we are. Our, our generation, this generation today is, is way out of whack. I mean, way out of whack. Okay? Because the discipline has gone down the drain. It's gone. And we blame it on everything. We do. We blame it on everything except where the blame really needs to be set. But we've allowed this to happen. To let go of our agendas, to take steps down the pathway of God's plan <clears throat> for our lives requires that we decide once and for all what we believe. Do we believe the Word of God 
in every condition, every circumstance, and every situation, or do we not? Jesus says, you either love me or you hate me. You can't love me and hate me both at the same time. You've got to do one. You've got to love me and hate Satan. Or you've got to love Satan and hate me. We can't, we can't have both of them. We can't straddle the fence. You can't straddle the fence. You've got to be one way or the other. We need to accept the word of God as our standard for right and for wrong. God's standard is never going to change, folks. It's always going to be the same. Now, our world doesn't see it that way. They don't believe in absolute truth. This world that we live in does not believe in absolute truth. It believes in everything else except that. We need to accept it. the Word of God as our standard for right and wrong, for true and for false, for good and for evil. And having accepted that, listen, this is what's going to happen. It will affect you how you live the rest of your lives. It will affect who you are and what you are. We need to do everything in our power to make the foundation of our lives by trusting in the Word of God. If we'll put a trust in Him, listen, I'm not talking about just here on Sunday morning. It's easy to trust in God sitting in this building. Amen? It's real easy, but when you get out of this building, it's pretty hard. Ain't that right, Christian? Yes. Amen. It's pretty tough, ain't it? It's pretty tough to, to, to live a Christian life in the world. In here it's easy, but out there it's hard. <coughs> letting God our agendas and letting God direct our paths, we'll choose the right path and let God direct it, and He will put us on the right path. Right. The second thing we need to look at is what did I tell you what it was? Anybody write it down? Let go of our idols. Let go of our idols. All right, listen to this. We have to let God be the center of our hearts. He has to be the center of our hearts. Look what He says. Put off concerning your formal conduct. The old man which grows corrupt and according to the deceitful lust. We have idols. All of us have them. I don't have any. Yes, you do. We all have idols. We all like something real well. Is that right? Yeah. We all like something real well. And if we don't watch out, we'll let it get in the way of God. It's not unusual for us to do that, folks. That's typical. That's our nature. Our nature is not to love God. Our nature is to, is to love the world. That's our nature. You see, when Adam and Eve, when God said, look, <laughs> you see that tree over there? Don't mess with it. And when they went over and took the tree of knowledge and good and bad, and they ate that apple or whatever fruit it was, they disobeyed God, and the Bible said that the world fell right then. Our nature is of Adam and Eve. What's our nature? It's to live according to the world. But then the Lord said, okay, I've done all I can do, so now I'm going to have to send my son yes. to go to the cross for him. And he can make up their agenda. And when we allow him to do his agenda and put off the old idols, then God will bless us accordingly to what, who we are and what we are. There's a statement made by Jonah. Y'all know who Jonah is, right? Jonah the well. Yeah, the one was in the belly of the whale. Or the big fish, or whatever you want to call me. I told you the little joke about the <coughs> teacher and the little girl got an argument about. The teacher said, There's no way a fish could swallow a man. There's no way. And the little girl said, Well, they did. She said, Well, how do you know that? She said, In the Bible, the Bible says that Jonah got swallowed by a fish. She said, There's no way a fish could swallow a man. She said, Well, God said they could. She said, Well, how do you know that? She says, Well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask God. And he'll let me know. And if you get to hell, you ask him down there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, folks. Jonah made this statement. Jonah 2, chapter 2, verse 8. This is what he says. Those who regard worthless idol forsake their own mercy. That's what Jonah said. Forsake their own hope. It also says in the ESB, forsake their own faithfulness. They forsake their own mercy by worthless idols. Hmm. Anything we hold higher in regard than God becomes an idol. No matter what it is. You know, now, I have always been, and, 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 and God had to take this away from me, I have always been a sucker when it comes to new automobiles. Always. Man, I could go every two years 
and buy me a new car. Brother Eugene Robinson, Lenny said one time, Ned must need some new tires on his car because he got a new car. <laughs> Instead of going to buy two hundred dollars worth of tires, I go buy ten thousand dollar automobile. But I was a real sucker for that. I was a real sucker. So I had, you know, and I really believe that God took that away from me. Why? Because I started driving old cars. And I think the way he took that away from me was my wife had an automobile wreck with that girl and that boy back there and had come home one night. They were just little, but she was coming down 41 right there at Missouri Town at the caution light. And a drunk hit her in the rear in a 1982 Cadillac, 81 Cadillac, and turned her clear around the road. And if she hadn't been in a big car, he would have killed her. Because I went and got that car without God's permission. I believe that with all my heart, folks. I went and got that car without asking God if I could have it because I've always wanted. You hear what I'm saying? I have always wanted. You hear what I'm saying? I have always wanted. God had nothing to do with it. And God saved her life and my children's life. And ever since then, I kind of just got, well, you know, God, whatever you want. Whatever you want, Lord. Anything we hold, we hire, regard to Him is an idol. It's worthless, as Jonah says, but it's an idol nonetheless. Putting our focus and our energies and our devotions on worthless idols, we will forsake the mercy of God and lose hope that is available to all of us through God's love. We'll lose hope if we put worthless idols in front of God. Listen to what John says. Do not love the world. Hear me now, children. Nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Really, that's what it says in the Word of God. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away, and also all of its lust. But the one who loves the will of God, listen to this, children, lives forever. You'll never pass away. Don't love the world. The world has nothing to offer you. Sure, there's a lot of stuff in the world. Matter of fact, when I was coming to church this morning, there's a man right down the street from me. He got the fine, 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 double fine, oh, more and so fine boat I've ever seen. It's about a 30, 28, 26, 28 foot. Got dual engines on the back of it. It's big. It's to take out in the Gulf, 50 miles. That's my kind of fishing. Okay? I have to really be real careful because that is something that I could idolize if I'm not careful. Mm -hmm. The man's going fishing today. I'm not going fishing today. He's going fishing. He's fishing for fish. Listen, man. I'm fishing for men. Amen. Amen. Listen, we got to really be careful, don't we, folks? The That's world so. has a lot to offer us. The world has a lot to offer us, but you know what? You know what Jonah said? That's worthless idols. Nonetheless, we all have them. We have to be real careful. I mean, when Eric and I was down there yesterday, Eric was looking at them fine looking. Well, they pretty one they said. They were fine looking, boy, and they were fine looking too. I'm not kidding you. Eighteen hundred dollars worth of drums. And that's just for the drums, the red things you see. That had nothing to do with the other stuff. Eighteen hundred dollars for them things. I mean, you know, you got to be real careful. He could idolize that real easy. I'm looking around at the amplifiers and the guitars, and you know, I said, real easy if I'm not careful. I got six or seven now. How many more I need? <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's what we do. We all have that, and we have to be real careful. You see, listen. <laughs> In order for us to let go and let God work in our lives and allow Him to do the works of our lives, we got to give up this stuff. We got to give up the idols. We got to do. We got to put God first in our life. I can preach you that. You know why I can preach you that? Because I preach it to me all the time. That's why I can preach it to you. Because I got to be real careful. Preachers are just men, folks. They're no different than you. You guys. You put your britches on the same way I do, like this. I mean, girls put their britches on that way. One leg at a time. My wife puts her dresses on like this, you know. But it's different. Listen, 
we got to really be careful because we're not willing to give up our idols. And if we give up our idols, God will use us a whole lot more than what we're being used. Mm -hmm. How can you know? The sister asked me this morning, how can you know, Ned, when somebody's evil? How can I know? I can tell by the way they talk. I can tell by the way they walk. I can tell by the way they even smell. You can tell. You have something that that children of God have something that nobody else has. You can tell by the way people are talking, how they do things, whether they're a child of God or not. And they're a child of God, but what do you say? Don't love the world. If you love the world, you don't love me. That's what the Lord said, amen? That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Father said. You can't love the world and love God, too. You have to love one and hate the other. That's what the Bible says. <sighs> Listen. This command that he gave us in, in 1 John chapter 2, he command, that's a command he gives. He says, the world is passing away. And also, it's lust. All the lust of the world is passing away, folks. But the one who does the will of God will live forever. That's a commandment. You know what it says? The commandment says, the command is absolute. That's like the world don't believe in absolute truth. The command is absolute. Listen to me. It's not relevant. It's absolute. It says... It does not say, don't love the world too much. It don't say that, does it? No, it doesn't. It says, not at all. Don't love the world at all. The world here does not mean the earth and its people. Listen, God himself loved the world so much that he gave his son to save his people. But listen to me real close now. But rather, the world as a system or worldview made up of ideals and beliefs that exclude God. It has nothing to do with the people of the world. It's the people that exclude God in it. That's what the problem is. It's not the world. God made this world for you and me. Okay, and man fell. When he fell, he turned it over to the devil. Guess what he's doing? I'm making you a new world. I'm going to make a new world for you. That's talking to me. That's talking to you if you know Christ. He's going to give us something different than what we have. What is it? No Satan. <laughs> no Satan. No, no, nothing to, to, to make us lust after anything. Lust doesn't always mean sex, folks. It doesn't always mean that. We're not to love the things which are sought to pamper the appetite or to please the eye or to promote pride in our living. That's not what we're doing. We're not here for that. These are the objects and subjects. These are the objects sought and made by idols. These things are made by idols. You know, what do men look at? You know what a man's most in the idol is? You know what it is? A woman. That's a man's idol. You see, you know, I've been telling you all this ever since I've been here. I ain't preached it yet. God ain't let me preach it yet. God saved the best for last. You don't even know what I'm talking about. You're talking about woman. That's right. What do you make of the very last thing? He made the woman. He made the best for last. And when he gave her to Adam, what did Adam do? He looked at her and said, my, my, oh, my. Where did she come from? <laughs> huh? God made the woman the most beautiful thing there was, folks. Man's, man's, man's thing is, 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 is to look at the woman and look up on her with his eyes of lust. Their days are going to go away. And they're coming soon and very soon. We are going to see the king one day, and all that's going to turn around. The secular worldview places a little importance on God. The secular world doesn't think about God. Instead, it focuses on all that is in the world, which is the opposition of God. Hang on here now. I'm almost done. All that is in the world is not, is not from God, and when we put them at the center of our heart, they become worthless idols. All the things of the world. Hear what I'm saying, children? All the things of the world are worthless idols. Guess what? They fall into these categories. The lust of the flesh, number one. The lust, lust which has its seed and source in our lower animal nature. Satan tried to tempt that from God, from Christ himself. He said, command this stone to be made bread. And what did Jesus tell him? Maybe not the bread. That's exactly what he told him. Huh. But every word, what did he say after that, Mike? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
Yeah. Right, brother? Right. So it has nothing to do with it. Jesus spoke of how adultery begins with not with the act, but with the desire. It has nothing to do with the act. It has to do with the desire. <laughs> While an often limit the category to refer mostly to sexual lust, any sort, listen to this, any sort of selfish or greedy craving simply to satisfy what physical desire is lust of the flesh. Amen. Not just the sex, folks, it's lust of the flesh. If you desire it for the physical body, it's lust of the flesh. <laughs> Hear me, right? Not about the same thing, right? We like to talk about people like to drink, like to smoke, and like to do all this stuff. You're really, really going to want to really give them hell, okay? What about eating too much? Yeah. That's a lust of the flesh just as well as it yeah. is the sex of a, of a man with a woman, of a daughter of a man with a woman. Ain't no different. See? That's what I'm telling you. I can preach this stuff to you. Why? I'm a human being just like you, and I've got to watch it myself. Amen. <clears throat> the second thing that you have is the lust of the eyes. Man accumulates possessions. He bows to idols of materialism. People's eyes can lust after many things. All kinds of stuff. Eat one of the fruit from the pleasing to the eye. Right? So she wanted, she wanted the fruit. Right? Listen to this. Achan saw the beautiful robe of Babylon of the silver and gold and he wanted it. That's found in Joshua. Listen. And David saw a beautiful woman bathing and he wanted her. The eyes. Here it is when people would have to be blind not to see anything, but believers must not become obsessed with what they see. We see all this stuff in the world, but we don't have to be, it's just like this, folks. You have to live in this world, but you don't have to be part of it. You know why? I just preached a message last week that says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Mm -hmm. Huh? That's right. Jesus said this, look in John chapter 16, this is what he said. Listen, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation, lust of the eyes, lust of, the, of, of this and lust of that, okay? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye. And the th third or fourth thing here, life. We have that stuff in us. Why? But he says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Why? Because be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. The pride of life. Some various translations says the pride of possessions. We have pride in what we have. It refers to both the inward attitude and the outward boasting because of obsession with one status or possessions. There's people that their status is high bucket him up. They up here with the upper left on. That's why Jesus came to the lost. That's why he came to the poor. Why? Because they listened to him. Guess what people with a lot of possessions gonna do? They're not gonna listen to him. Not all of them. Don't misunderstand me now. There are rich people that listen to God, but most of them don't. Because they are possessed with all kinds of great stuff. Rich, plenty of money, all kinds of things. Of, you know, I mean, this man, that boat he got probably cost $65,000, $70,000 or not more. That man got lots of money. He probably didn't even talk to me if I wouldn't talk to him about taking me fishing. Or even $1,000 be for him to take me. I ain't paying nobody $1,000 to go fish. I go fish off the bank before I pay that. <laughs> Listen, folks, the pride of life, man, has so much that they become arrogant. They have so much. Satan tries a temptation on Christ and said to him in the temple pinnacle that spiritual pride and presumption. He said, what did he say? Command these stones to turn into bread. You know what else Satan told me? Look out here what I got. <laughs> yeah, this is this, folks. He said, look out here what I got. I got all this and you can have it. He was talking to the wrong guy. What do you mean? I already got it. <laughs> it's mine. It ain't yours. It's mine. The only reason why I just let you use it for a while. Folks, that's just like the offering that you give, the money that you make. God just let you use it. It don't belong to you. It belongs to God. He just let you use it for a while. Yeah, I knew that preacher was going to put that in there somewhere. <laughs> Listen, God owns it all. God owns the mountains. God owns the cattle. God owns all the cattle. He owns all the mountains. He owns everything. Everything around it belongs to Him. The love of God and the love of worldly things are incompatible. They cannot be the same. 
A Christian cannot live with a divided heart. <clears throat> we must demonstrate to ourselves as well as to God that we know Him and we must let Him go, let go of our eyes and let God have the center of our heart. The third thing and the last one is this. Let go of our what? We have to let go. He says, what did he say here? What does he say? He says, put off the old man. Verse 20 says, 3 says, renew the spirit of your mind. And verse 24, what does he say? Put on a new man. A new one. <laughs> Which was created, now listen to this church, according to God in true righteousness and holiness. God made man to be righteous and to be holy. He did. That's the way he made man. He made him that way. If we're honest, we can relate with the church in Corinth that Paul wrote. This is what he wrote. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? You see that? That's what Paul said. Do not be deceived, he said. Neither fornicators nor adulterers or adulterers nor infidels, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. <laughs> really? Yeah. Look out in the world. Do we not have adulterers? Do we not have people that covet what other people have? Do we not have that in our world today? Do we not have homosexuals? Do we not have thieves? Huh? Do we not have drunkards? Do we not have revilers, swindlers, trying to get you to buy this and get you to buy that? What was that I used the other day? What was that called? What did I name it? Uh, when, you, when they misguide people. There's a word they call it. Y'all don't remember and neither do I. Right? <laughs> Deception. Huh? Deception. Deception. But there was a... We, we, use, we use it all the time. It's con artists. You know, car that's what they are, yeah. They use something to get you in there. Oh, I got them. I got them yesterday, right, honey? We got them yesterday. Two rows of them. Rows about that long, about that big around. This is what it says, Jimmy. They got keys in them. <laughs> this is a key for your new car. I got two keys. I got two tracks. I'm going to go up there. It's right there at Winky Watching. And I'm going to take them two keys. And I'm going to walk around them cars and see if it'll start one of them. Just and if it starts it, I'm just going to get in and drive home. <laughs> <laughs> I got a key for it, so it's mine, right? No. They, they cannot get you for stealing it, is it? No, I got a key for it. They sent me the key <laughs> in the mail. Get off the the Listen, folks, okay. don't we have that? Don't we have swindlers? Don't we have all that? The Bible says you have that. When we become Christians, we must let go of our own selves. We must let go of us, who we are. The lives that we lead by the agenda of idols in the world, let God take over them, Paul says. Let him, let him take over them idols. Let Him take over that worldly things that you have. Let God do it. Let God do it. Let go, and as Harry put down, and get God. When you get God, things in your life will change. Listen to what said he said. How about done now, y'all? Hang on. I got 10 minutes yet. My Lord, I'm doing real good this morning. <laughs> Listen to this. Ephesians, look what it says. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, listen now. That's what I just read you, the verses 21 through 24. Listen. Just as truth is in Jesus, that in the reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness to the truth. Wow! What are they saying here? Look what he says. Look what he says. You put on a new man, which is a created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. The Bible says this. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17. That's what I said about the board out there. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If you are in Christ... You are a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things become new. 
You know what? I've been preaching this my whole life. And you know what? I'm really, I'm really sad. Most of the people that come to church and they're Christians don't put off the old self and put on the new self. What was that Lenny preached here? Y'all remember what he preached here? Not the last time. Bring, bring bring the bags, the garbage bags. The yeah. Bags. What, what was it you said? Two garbage bags and a shovel. Two garbage bags and a shovel. We bring our, 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 our agendas, we bring our, our sins down to God, we bring our, our, our burdens down to the altar, we give them to God, when we get up, we just fill the bag back up and take it on back with us where we, when we first came up. We ain't no different than what we was when we got here. Leave it there. Oh, one thing I do remember. <laughs> he might be young, but he sure knows his back. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, folks, our agenda has nothing to do with God's agenda. God says, my way of thinking is not your way of thinking. I don't think the same way you think, God says. I don't do things the way we do them. We need to get rid of our agendas and give them to God. Secondly, we need to what? Huh? Give God our idols. We need to give them to Him and let Him take them. You know what God will do with your idols? He'll throw them in the garbage. Because He don't need your stuff. And then we need to give ourselves, old selves, over to the Lord. That's how you need to let go and let God work in your life. He's not going to work in your life as long as you hang on to these things. He is not going to. You know, I can just about feel sometimes when God starts to work in my life, and guess what? I do something that ain't supposed to be done. Guess what He does? He just takes it right away. You may fool man, but you ain't going to fool God. He knows exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, why you even thought about doing it before you do it. Before you do it. Praise God for that he does. Amen, right, church? Amen. Amen. Listen to this. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. This is Paul. Listen to what he says. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Letting go of our old selves and letting God have our new selves. <coughs> Paul says, I haven't reached it yet. Let me tell you something, children. I ain't reached it yet. I ain't there yet. He's still working on me, buddy. He's going to make me what he wants me to be one day. But until he does, we've got to work hard at it. It's not no easy job. <laughs> to let go and allow God means to give back to God that which he already has. Which is already his. And you know what that is? Our lives. It already belongs to him. When we let go and allow God, we adopt his agenda for our own. We make him the center of our heart and devote ourselves to doing his will. And in doing so, we will reap the benefit of his love, his blessings, and his promise of eternal life through our belief in his son, Jesus Christ. Now that's what God will do for you. He's the only one who can do that too. Nobody else can do that. Nobody's ever went to the grave and rose from the dead. Nobody. But him. Don't forget that, folks. Nobody has ever done that. Matter of fact, Mohammed is still in the grave. They go over and dig him up. He ain't nothing but bones. Digging up bones. <laughs> It ain't nothing there. <laughs> and I got a little dog of mine. Schroeder. When this and I first got married, we bought a little, what was that dog called? Miniature dog. Winter, 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 winter dog. Winter, winter, winter dog. We got him. He was about that big around. About that long. <laughs> and my brother said, you got cheated. <laughs> you ain't got no winter dog. <laughs> you got a hound dog. <laughs> and then he started going just. And he no started going like this. I lost that little dog. He got run over by a truck. Like to kill me and Melissa and Eric and Benjamin. Like to kill us. Losing that little dog, right? I buried him in the backyard. You go dig him up. Guess what's there? Oh, nothing. It's gone. There's no bones there. They, they, they disintegrated. That's what happened to Muhammad was he disintegrated. They can dig up all they want. They ain't going to find nothing there. 
But you go to the grave of Jesus, and guess what you're going to find? You ain't going to find nothing. Why? Because he rose from the dead, and he's the only one that's ever done it. All you're going to see is bones and dust and garbage in the other graves, but not in the Lord's grave. His grave is empty. I preached a message. I might preach it this year on Easter. It's called, the tomb wasn't really empty, you know. I'll preach it this Easter. The tomb wasn't really empty. Keep that in mind. Say, preacher, when are you going to preach that? I'll preach it for you this year. Listen. Over and over, the scripture makes it clear that the ultimate offering God desires from us is to give our lives over in complete dependence on God's ways. That's his, that's his desire. Now, we used to have Bible study with Earl every Friday. How many of y'all remember what he used to say? Hear God and do what he says. Well, yeah, but he, that's not what he used to say every Friday. What he used to say? Huh? He used to tell us this. God is alive. And he'll never change what he is. He'll make you what he wants you to be if you just allow him to do it. And that's what he used to tell us. I don't know if y'all remember that. I remember him telling me that. I don't remember him saying that. Maybe it wasn't at our power of It was him and I were doing it together. But he used to tell me that all the time. Brother Ned, listen. God made you for one reason. I do say this. How many of y'all remember this? What did he make man for? Why did God make man? To have a relationship with him. That's what he used to tell us all the time, right? And that's what he did. He made man to have a relationship with him. God's one thing that he looks at, wants us to do is he wants us to offer ourselves to him. Give ourselves to him. Complete dependence on him and on his ways. For us it remains to do this, to let go and allow God. Will let go of the world and allow God to do His work. God will do it. Now, somebody refresh me real quick. What did I say the three were? Come on. Let go of our agendas. That's right. Our idols. That's right. And then ourselves. That's right. The old self. You get a new body. You know, you get a new life. One day. Hey, I remember. On that resurrection morning when all the dead in Christ shall rise, I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Stand with me this morning if you would. <coughs> everything I preach on, folks, is all about songs. I got a song for everything I preach on. When you've been a musician, as long as I've been a musician, you've got all kinds of songs. Yeah. Huh? If you don't, then you make one, right? If you don't, you make them up. <laughs> I've been doing music ever since I was 14. I've been playing the guitar since I was 14 and I'm 70. That's a long time to play the guitar. That's older than any of my kids. I hope so. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you all for coming today. Now listen, if God's speaking to your heart and you need to let go and allow God to work in your life, why don't you just do that this morning? You don't have to come down here unless you want to. You can do it right where you're standing. Or if you'd like to come up here and sit on this on these front chairs up here and say, God, I want you to take over my life. Why don't you do that? Or you can do it right where you're at. Or raise that hand and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? That I'll let God overcome my life. Would you do that this morning? Will y'all lift your hand and say, yes, I'll do that. I'll try my best, Pastor, to let God overcome in my life. I'll do my best. And that's all God really asks of you, to do your best. That's all He cares. That's all He cares, that you try your best. And God will bless you if you will let it. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you today for Jesus, and we thank you for the opportunity just to be here in this place one more time. Bless these folks, God, that keep coming in and faithful every Sunday, and I just want you to, to praise and give them the glory. And God, I want you to help them, strengthen them, and God, let them know how much you love them. You said, if you'll be faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. And God, they're trying to be faithful as best they can. And they lifted those hands this morning and said, Lord, I want to allow you to work in my life. And Father, why don't you just do that with them this week? Help them to overcome the obstacles that they run into. And we praise you for it and thank you for it. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Folks were having dinner. Young lady, y'all stayed 